Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this keynote speech in the Psychology of Global Crises virtual conference. My name is Robert Bashara, and I'm one of the co-organizers. Uh, I'm going to be introducing our keynote speaker now, and then she will have 30 to 45 minutes to speak, and then uh, we'll end with a Q&A. Dr. Babette Babish is professor of philosophy at Fordham University. Her research and interests include science, technology, music, art, classics, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Adorno, Anders, pop, museum, and film culture. Her most recent book is The Hallelujah Effect, Philosophical Reflections on Music, Performance Practice, and Technology. It was published by Rutledge in 2016. The title of Dr. Babish's keynote speech is Pseudoscience and Fake News, Inventing Epidemics and the Police State. Please, the floor is yours, Dr. Babish. Okay, that, sh that should be me. I hope I can be heard. Uh, that's always a question. One, one never knows if one can be heard. <laughs> okay, but in any case, let's. Let, I'm going to start, and I'm going to start by by thanking uh, the uh, actually by everything. But I also have a, have a PowerPoint. A PowerPoint can make things a little bit easier on Zoom. So I'm going to share that screen if I can find it. Let's see where we are. Uh, maybe there. That should be all right. With any luck, you can see that now. Uh, Pseudoscience and Fake News Inventing Epidemics in the Police State. That's the title. Um, and one of the things I'd like to do is begin by thanking the organizing committee, uh, particularly uh, Robert Beshara and Martin Dege and Irene Strasser for the invitation to speak to you, everyone, today. I'm looking forward, as I think everyone is, to the rest of this promising 10-day conference. My talk is a somber one, and for that I apologize in advance. Lockdown, I have several section titles. The psychological effects of loneliness, already a consequence of our digital era, are well known. Lockdown has all the features of solitary confinement, a prohibition on social contact, a requirement that one keep distance when approaching others, the limitation on the amount of time one is permitted to be outside, exactly one hour, quite as specified for those incarcerated, limited to a specific distance around the home, also as specified in the case of criminal confinement, and all of these have damaging effects. The point of containment is, we're told, for our own good, intended to limit the spread of COVID-19, although news reports are contrary, sometimes suggesting this hasn't worked, that the virus already more infectious than supposed had already spread to more individuals asymptomatically than expected. This is in keeping with what is known about both infectious diseases and immunology. Staying indoors, however, is not ideal for the health and wearing masks in the case of healthy people is problematic as these happen to make it harder for you to breathe and thus add to physiological stress. Thus, newspapers in the UK at least have recently reminded those suffering from asthma and other respiratory illness not to wear masks as these force one to re-inhale one's own exhaled breath along with expelled dust and other waste. From a physiological point of view, I started as a biologist, not a philosopher, exhalation is excretion. To re-inhale your exhaled carbon dioxide into a confined space, that is, inside your mask, can only mean that you inhale less oxygen, which will lead to harmful effects over time, like headaches on the mild end of things to death at the extreme. This is a physiological stress, no one disputes this, which according to the CDC can be tolerated, that's their word, by most people. The point of requiring that you wear a mask is to remind you that it is you who are the cause of viral infection. You are a danger to others. Wearing a mask works to flag yourself 
and others that you are the problem. Way back in 1935, that was a beautiful picture, but <laughs> this is the next slide, Ludwig Fleck, an immunologist, Polish immunologist argued that the problem with virtuous flags is that these can stand in place of a scientific understanding of disease propagation. He's talking, of course, about metaphors. I quote, as an example of such grossly popular science, consider an illustration representing the hygienic fact of droplet infection. A man emaciated to a skeleton and with grayish purple face is sitting on a chair and coughing. With one hand, he is supporting himself wearily on the arm of the chair. With the other, he presses his aching chest. The evil bacilli in the shape of little devils, where am I? are flying from his open mouth, an unsuspecting rosy-cheeked child is standing next to him. One devil bacillus is very, very close to the child's mouth. The devil has been represented bodily in this illustration, half symbolically and half as a matter of belief. But he also haunts the scientific specialty, this is the continuation, to its very depths. Sorry, we need Typhoid Mary for this. In the conceptions of immunological theory with its images of bacterial attack, and I don't know if you can see it, but she's throwing these, not devils, but little, little skulls into her, into her saucepan. And it's the images of bacterial attack and defense that we're going to try and talk about. To, we want, all of us, to follow the science. But as noted in my abstract, the video one I prepared to do this, we need a monolithic finished science, all facts like dogs, neatly chained up, to use Nietzsche's metaphor. And whose science should we follow? Some scientists, I've just quoted Fleck, remind us that a contagious agent is only part of the story when it comes to the immune system and hence to the spread of disease, thus the need to invent, that's his title, and establish a scientific fact to generate the Entstehung. Scientists are academics. And they claim glory for themselves whenever they can. And at the low and middle and highest levels, this tends to involve making fun of other scientists, denigrating others. So it's easy to find folk to mob. Academic mobbing is a technical term, I have to tell you this. There's actually research on the topic. Sukharit Bhakti or Wolfgang Vodag or Stefan Lanka, or Judy Mikovits, or even Luc Montagnier, just to name a few. The same thing happened to Giorgio Agamben when he raised questions, and I've written on this. Science is bedeviled by reigning paradigms, as Thomas Kuhn put it, prejudices, as Nietzsche supposed, an array of idée fixe. Idée fixe is the little uh, creature there. Also, the name of the little dog, you can see him carried about by the great figure in Asterix, very important, Obelix. It is fixed ideas that garner the grants, get the recognition, drive the laboratories. As a philosopher of a continental kind, including Nietzsche and Heidegger, along with Fleck and Latour, I write on science from the perspective of the history and philosophy of science, and I criticize the mainstream habit of dubbing some science pseudoscience. In this context, I write on uh, the virologist at the University of California at, at Berkeley, Peter Duisburg, an AIDS denialism, as it's called. Elsewhere, writing about Ivan Illich and what he called medical nemesis, which for Illich described the practice of an institution more dedicated to domination than health as such, I take care in my footnotes way at the end of the essay to cite Professor Ruth Itzhaki, the emeritus Manchester microbiologist who sought to research the role of infection, both bacterial and viral in Alzheimer's, contra the reigning paradigm of amyloid plaque. She never got funding. In the world of science research, funds are devoted exclusively, so Ms. Saki's work was systematically unfunded, to whatever one answer happens to be privileged. Peer review ensures this. Peer review is the buddy system. This buddy system is one of the reasons Michael Moore's new film, Planet of the Humans, 
released for free this past Earth Day, is neither fake nor false, but inconvenient for those who wish to imagine that one can simply shift one's investment portfolio and marry an old energy industry to a green new energy industry. Think outside the box and your work will languish unfunded by either academia or industry. In this question that I want to think about, I have a book, Nietzsche's philosophy of science. So looking or seeking as Nietzsche argued, as Heidegger argued, as I argue, a truth that is truth unchanging. We wish to believe in science in place of religion, a repository, once again, of truth unchanging. The importance is that nothing change. Denigrating theories we dislike or classifying scientific approaches that shake our prejudices as pseudoscience is a long standing tactic. It is how one writes scripture. It is a recipe for dogma. The next section. Inventing pseudoscience on science and its discontents. Here, what's at stake concerns what the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, borrowed tacitly from Ludwig Fleck. We've already introduced him, the Polish physician. He's the one on the corner. I, I have fire weapons in the beginning just for, just for good luck. Uh, who invented his own paradigm for the immune system, what he called Fleck, leukergy, an immunological theory focused on white blood cells, leukocytes. In an age of coronavirus, COVID-19, historical discussions of the immune system are important. I already quoted from Ludwig Fleck's Gen the genesis and development of a scientific fact, which is a study of syphilis, a complex disease entity in history, what disease is it? What are we talking about? Where does it come from? Apparently, uh, every locus has been proffered as candidate for what tends to be called the French pox, the carnal French disease with the great S's here, or carnal scourge. And its definition, did Shakespeare have it? Did Nietzsche have it? And in any case, to what kind of disease does it refer? You'd think they'd know. You'd be wrong. As a disease, syphilis morphs from one thing to another in the body, first presenting as a skin disease, to progress to a disease of the blood, to proceed after decades of incubation, that's a technical term, to colonize the brain and the meninges, and including polyarthritis. The Lvov born Fleck, a Jew, who used both science and art to fight the Nazis, as only a medical serologist could do, by means of a vaccine prepared to be inert, not that the Nazi officers who ordered him to do so could ever have known what was in the serum that he injected them with. Thus Fleck is the second He's unnamed scientist in Arthur Allen's 2015 book, The Fantastic Laboratory of Dr. Weigel, how two brave scientists battled typhus and sabotaged the Nazis. A component, just one of the longstanding debates on vaccination lurks in this and other details. Our prejudices, Nietzsche reminds us, Heidegger reminds us, get in the way of our thinking. Thus, Karl Mannheim, Influential for Fleck, distinguished between total and what he named particular ideology, where total ideology would bear on the psychology of global crises that is the concern of this conference. Yet we are suspicious of words like ideology. And in 1993, the evolutionary biologist at Harvard, Richard Lamontin, author of The Ideology of Biology, was roundly attacked. It didn't help Lamontin that he held the Louis Agassiz chair in zoology at Harvard. When one exposes certain ideologies, those who stand to profit from those same ideologies will strike back. Lamontin, a mathematician, wanted to look at the numbers and not less the role of public health measures in terms of clean water and clean air, as well as overall improvements in the standard of living along with increased income uh, for a given population. He thought all those factors might factor in. Others preferred to imagine that the fall of infectious disease could simply be ascribed to modern medical interventions, full stop, like drugs of one sort 
or like vaccines. This is certainly the way the World Health Organization intervenes in poor communities in Asia and Africa. No food, no programs to bring, I'm having difficulty with my mouse if life is like that, clean water to people, just vaccinations for all. There we are. These names, Fleck, Kuhn, Lewontin, are all old names. Yet, and this is a key question here, their questions remain unresolved, even if Facebook and Twitter fact checkers are sure that one can simply Google the facts and there they'll be, ready to hand for the advantage of the CDC, the World Health Organization, the government, and what seems to be nearly every country in the world with the possible exception, but I'm not sure that's entirely true of Sweden. For many, this will be a push to remain on lockdown rather than to strengthen one's immune system via contact with others, with the world, with the earth itself. Once again, remaining indoors is not healthy, nor is wearing a mask, especially not for long stretches at a time. The police state of which I speak is not merely the overeager enforcement leading to substantial fines and incarceration in ca some cases of, 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 of current COVID measures to the law, however those are interpreted. We ourselves have become our own jailers. We ourselves, the whistleblower on our neighbor or fellow townsperson walking too close to others in the open air, in a park, at the beach, on the street or while shopping for food at the supermarket. I will not today be able to develop these reflections to go where they should go, namely to what we owe the living, the sick elsewhere. In my reflections on a, a Gambin, there, I have a slide, yes, there's a webpage no one seems to be able to find. I've already added Camus and Sophocles and Milton in my reflections on what we owe the dead. But before I continue with a different discussion of necropolitics, I will note, because it's one of the corporal works of mercy, here I have a slide for that, to visit the sick, even those who are ill who happen to be strangers to us, regarding what we owe ourselves and those around us, family and colleagues and strangers, as we are ourselves reciprocally, all of us, strangers, one to another. I have another section, necropolitics in an injectable. Achille Mbembe's necropolitics explicates Carl Schmidt with a twist yielding the power syndrome that currently dominates our lives. As Agamben also writes about this now in Mbembe's words to dictate, I quote, who may live and who must die. I foreground the micro thing that is feedback in the hallelujah effect. Cybernetics 101, the click closes the circuit. Having input anything, all we need is a confirmation, click or swipe. The critical theorist, the philosopher Gunther Anders, son of the psychologist William Stern, he invented the IQ test, analyzed this in terms of homeworking, such that, and Cavellians might take note, we dedicate ourselves to radio, cinema, television, cable, TV, our iPads, our tablets, precisely enough to be able to identify references on demand, follow sports teams, politics, Twitter, what have you. It is the same, ontologically speaking, be this on our cell phones, laptops, or television, YouTube, as long as there is a connection with a screen, visually come haptically online. A concern with online events or fear of missing out, as this has been analyzed by psychologists, sociologists, political theorists, excuse our presence absence by the same token. The feedback loops offer the simulacrum that is the illusion of, and I quote an ancient stoic, talk of our own name. As Marcus Aurelius wrote some 2000 years ago, the itch for talk of our own name is a destructive addiction. But today's social media has addicted all of us, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it hardly matters. We are all celebrities. Richard Seymour says in his The Twittering Machine, all Royals, as I argue at a very fluffy uh, in interview with, with some folks at, at, at Fordham University. 
everybody, as I've written elsewhere, is Harry Potter. Thus, websites pretend to know us individually, personally. I'm, I'm, okay. That background noise, which I worry about. The, the efficacy seems universal and we have, this is also crucial, the neural research to prove it. Someone says your name, someone focuses on you and this makes you think that you are important. Having set ourselves up to follow life online and to amass followers online, we are poised for a pandemic brought to us in the sheltering in place comfort of our own homes. I can't get there, there we are. Nietzsche on immaculate perception and Gunther Anders ghosts. Nietzsche asks how we can expect to know anything as he writes of the world given our propensity for conceptual schematism, he asks. How could explanations be at all possible when we first turn everything into an image, our image? Nietzsche talks between our longing for what he calls immaculate perception, a longing to know the world, and at the same time, to exclude ourselves as knowers from the world. This would be, as the analytic tradition in philosophy names it, the view from nowhere. Not only do we presume the universality of our view, we presume our invisibility. Today we are, willy-nilly, in the stasis of lockdown, equalized spectators captivated by programs, advertising the newest news, along with the newest, latest gadget. So we buy massively online, enriching Jeff Bezos in the process. Assuming our invisibility behind our screens, focused on them as we are, we also manage to overlook what we technically know to be a given. This is our axiom today, ubiquitous surveillance. Now, I already mentioned Gunther Anders, but as Ernst Traubert reminds us in a 2005 essay entitled with the phrase borrowed from Anders, torturing things until they confess, we still seem to have no idea who Anders is. But it surely owes something to his radical, and as Schwaber emphasizes, literally extensive critique of technology. And here, Anders, not despite, but because of his critique is essential, as is Jean Baudrillard, who matters, as the current crisis is adumbrated by the transmissions of broadcast media, social media, that is, the internet, the same way that I am talking to you, although you are not here, via Zoom, although actually in the so-called real world, I am in a room in a townhouse in Winchester in Hampshire, England, talking to a screen. Pocket convenience is the mode for old-fashioned technology, Dick Tracy style, wristwatch, walkie-talkies. The new tracking technology goes beyond that. It is inhaled, here I quote, in smart dust, that's a quote, or injected as dye and quantum dots to track vaccination and so on. People as sensors, as the Australian sociologist M.G. Michaels writes. Anders wrote in 1930 about radio ghosts. Cancel culture, along with the phenomenon of ghosting, are, one may argue, I'm gonna come back to that, artifacts of the texting platform on which it exists, a leftover trace echoing the CRT screens of yesteryear, but which also continues to haunt LCD monitors and HDTVs. The current phenomenon is a metaphor, not a burnt or fixed trace, but ongoing, projected into the real world, where one may be, as the whole of our former life has been canceled like conferences and commencement celebrations and school terms, ghosting face to face, obliquely, as some ignore others to show disdain, disapproval, exclusion in school lunchrooms and playgrounds. The name is new, castle culture, ghosting, the social phenomenon, hardly so, common practice on small town streets or in corporate or university hallways, the trick of not seeing folk as one passes them by, this is a negative version of mobbing, and it's often studied. I must make scrunchy noises here. Apologize for that. I seem to have scrunch all the time. Sorry about that. Obviously, we study this in all kinds of fields. Will that work? No. 
somehow my policy works, but this. <laughs> in philosophy, the mechanism drives the analytic continental divide and accounts for validation, most obvious when withheld. We listen to certain experts and dismiss others as doing bad work or defending pseudoscience, or worse yet, what some of us dub conspiracy. The sense in which we have to do with what underlies the interface, qua invisible, we take for granted. In this fashion, we are hacked without our knowledge. Most digital viruses, we use the same term for computers as for our bodies, live as bacteria and viruses et al. In our bodies live happily coexisting, nicely named cookies in our computers or laptops, sending back the data they track without our leave, but much more crucially, beneath our notice. And philosophically, we can ask the Leibnizian question, is this a difference that makes any difference? Why should we care? Many of these cookies are embedded in legal ways. We give permission constantly. Part of the software packages, as we name them, that we ourselves install. Thus, David Berry, but you can also check out Gary Hall's Pirate Philosophy or Alexander Stingle's The Digital Coloniality of Power, name everyone else's name here. We long ago persuaded ourselves of the importance of vaccination and extended this to virus protection, always on security, that is also, of course, always on tracking in our digital devices. If this can be injected into our bodies, so much the better, some scholars argue. But the scale has changed in the interim from microchips to nanochips and softer still as so-called quantum dots delivered I'm quoting MIT News from December 2019, along with a vaccine. This technology to do this is, of course, already several years old. In today's age of what I call screen being, we do not see the screen. Screen cleaners and special microfiber wipes for screens are increasingly unnecessary because we aren't looking at the screen. We see through and beyond the glass surface. If being online increasingly encompasses the entirety of a person's affective life, including porn, including masturbatory habits that have become mainstream, but also including romance, dating apps via little swipe screams left or right, adumbrated by what we do not see. Jean Baudrillard sought to map this. Sorry, I had two slides. I guess I should have chose this one, but I didn't. For us in his own work on media and its digitalization, reminding us that media largely works as the illusion, that's his emphasis of communion, communication, speech, yes, but without response. To the same extent, our response to so-called fake news is itself a manufactured artifact of our unshakable belief that given sufficient filters, blocking, censoring, alt or dangerous input, we can see the truth. Our responses to media, radio, television, film, internet feeds are controlled. And again, we insist that this is not so. Greg Milner in a book entitled Pinpoint explores the ubiquitous presence of tracking technology including a fair measure of global imperialism. Now, GPS is nothing innocuous. And if we were to do the math, a la Alan Oxley's uncertainties in GPS positioning, a mathematical discourse, we might be less than sanguine about this expressly invisible technology. But we do not do the math, nor do we remember details from day to day, not to mention invoking past experience, which is how weather manipulation, chemtrails, and the like proceed in plain sight. Tethered to our machines, we need plugs wherever we go, if ever we can go out again, if ever we can travel again, nursemaids as we are of our devices. We care for them, keeping our devices fully charged, handier than the Heideggerian ready to hand at all times. We worry about the same devices. Not wanting to miss anything is a characteristic of the ghosting phenomenon noted earlier. Technology, to this extent, is far more than an extension of our senses, as argued beginning in the 19th century. Technology extends our desires, crystallizing them. We know what it can bring us. 
and we are prepared to submit to its exigencies, solicitously attuned to our phones, attentive to the invisible jinns of Wi-Fi, WLAN, and cell phone towers, 4G, 5G, we don't care. Elsewhere, I write about the phenomenon of locative feedback appending the punch of Wittgenstein's map ponderings forever. You are the blue dot. Using GPS and a mapping app on a smartphone or tablet presents you with you, located as a little pulsing blue dot. If Wittgenstein's orienting problem persists, it's resolved quickly by the same circuit of feedback, take a few steps, take a few steps another way, input, response. Thus in lockdown, Pokemon Go has a newly quaint retro feel, and we may need to revisit games like Myst or Chris Bateman's new Silk Road just to be able to go somewhere in our minds the way old fashioned gamers used to do. Most of us can't do enough philosophy to do it the way Boethius did. Post phenomenology, post post phenomenology, that's to say, on vaccination and national security. The same rhetoric that can devalue a scientist or expert judgment can be used to counter claims, naming them conspiracy or a counter strategy sometimes used to confirm those same claims as casual facts. Here, I quote Jan Ratier on vaccines, as he points out, of course, vaccination is the best way to counter this pandemic, end quote. An expert on conspiracy theories, not a vaccination person, at the Amadou Antonio Foundation in Berlin, Rathier adds that the idea that compulsory vaccinations will be carried out in the future is quite widespread among conspiracy theorists. Note the smooth connection. Compulsory vaccination is a sentiment attributed to conspiracy theorists. And of course, just this is the best way forward. Hence, it's no surprise that an Oxford University practical ethics position paper recently posted online concludes with the brave new words, we think it's time, that's the quote, to put compulsory treatment and vaccination on the table. If Mari Lillestaten writing online in Science Norway can remind us that this I stole from the internet, you can tell. The coronavirus pandemic strengthens straight state authority. That's what she says. One of the things that should be underscored is that there's less debate about vaccination and whether or not it should be compulsory as the Oxford ethicists suggest it should be than in wondering when it will be ready to be forced on the general population. But as Bruno Latour, who writes about this at length in a book on vaccination, he subtly argued the pasteurization of France, Guépé, uh, des microbes. Well, Latour, not unlike the same Lewontin I already quoted, points to the complex thing that it is to bring vaccination to the country, as it were, but not less to the showmanship required. It was not the facts per se, but good media representation that made Pasteur a success, even then, way back then. As Latour writes, politics is not made with politics, but with something else. Here was a new source of power with which to conquer the state. The rest is propaganda. Thus Latour describes Bettenkoffer, Max von Bettenkoffer's casual quaffing of a beaker of cholera bacilli as part of a vastly more efficacious improvements he instigated to public health, and that would be clean water and the like. Latour has been making his points for a long time, Lewontin likewise, and so too, uh, even before then, Fleck, we've already cited, on typhus, likewise a tissue in the Barclay virologist Peter Duesberg's arguments on AIDS and HIV causality. Clearly, the point falls on deaf ears. So let's fast forward to the sure deployment of a vaccine. Having it, how can it be ensured that everyone goes along with it? Let's go back to the compulsory part of the Oxford recommendation on the table. Surveillance, as is argued in the book collection, Uber has to be obvious or it's pointless. To this end, in a 
digital age, people themselves are their own monitors. And I've already quoted this, that's to say people as sensors. If Kevin Haggerty, he's in the book, he's one of the contributors, 2006 reassuring conviction that there will be no 3 a.m. knock on the door by stormtroopers may seem naive today, given a few YouTube videos showing what appear to be precisely such incursions, what remains spot on is Haggerty's reflection by contrast that such tracking will be couched in the unassailable language of progress and social betterment, end quote. That is to say, we will be doing this, or the government will be doing it to us for our health. The effect is pure Foucault, discipline and punish, and we do submit, no tiki, no laundry, no vaccination certificate, no anything. Today, we already submit to all manner of vaccinations, especially for children. So smart tagging can be effected as one can count off the ways. Omnipresent, this is a quote, electronic surveillance might be implanted in the body, including smart swallowable pills, nanotech packs, is even smart dust, end quote. Such means of delivery are already in the air. But if you can inhale it, you can inject it, and injection is more efficient. How to write a narrative for a pandemic? So how does one invent an epidemic? How does one go about inventing a pandemic? My title mentions fake news, the sort of thing Steve Fuller thinks through very carefully with respect to counseling DARPA on, as it were, how to do it with respect to constructing our narrative. Narratives are important things for Hollywood and Cannes oriented movie makers and YouTube product influencers. You need a storyboard, a storyline important for the mystery novelist, he's recently been dying again, Umberto Eco, as he knew, and Leo Tolstoy, on a grand scale, writing War and Peace, Latour refers to this, but not less, Arthur Conan Doyle and his wonderfully pedantic invention, Sherlock, contra-specific and often bumbling doctor who played straight man to his boy or sexuagenarian genius. It really doesn't matter if you prefer Basil Rathbone, who is young here after all, or Benedict Cumberbatch, they're roughly the same age in this picture, as it is the same. One must line up one's ducks well and truly to ensure that the even more bumbling Scotland Yard or that greatest of bumblers, the reader of detective novels will draw the right conclusions. Most recently, JK Rowling did this for us in her Harry Potter, wherein we learned to hate a careful and rigorous teacher, Severus Snape, quite for being nomen est omen, a careful and rigorous teacher. We like teachers who are our buddies, teachers who would make us learn, not so much. Moving classes online is a dream come true. Here my point is the narrative. By telling her tale as she told it, Rowling was able to ensure that her child wizard fantasy novels and later the film series based on her books would sell and continue to sell Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, Sherlock Holmes, filmic distractions that have ruled our minds for so long that a professor with a specialization in philosophy of science, critical epistemology, aesthetics, that'd be me, includes such references in her teaching and research. We are soaking in the media that makes the invention of an epidemic possible. And by saying this, I am not talking content, king for the media makers, precisely because it is content that allows them to do what they need to do, namely to sell their product or advance the cause of global pandemic while keeping the world audience. This is a very huge move, otherwise distracted and yet fully focused. Everything is channeled via the internet. What used once upon a time to be radio programming, Hollywood film programming, television programming, print media, standardized textbooks. Now, thanks to COVID, the university itself, its best and worst teachers, without debate about should we do this on university senate floors, having at no cost at all to their universities, or at least in terms of getting them on board for it. They paid uh, various providers an awful lot of money, however, not the teachers, or to the government, 
maybe indirect costs perhaps, put their courses online. In many cases, asynchronously, meaning that it is now canned and packaged, calculable and reusable, rebrandable, quiet as they were told to do so in just this fashion. YouTube and Blackboard and Zoom and Moodle and Panopto must be breaking from the weight of all this content, except they're not. The claim that storage space is a thing in a virtual realm is a way to charge you more fees for more nowhere amounts of the same virtual drive. This is Langdon Winner's dark edusham in his parody prediction of yesteryear, or oh, go and read Friedrich Kittler again or Berry, etc. When one gets one's information from a single source or medium, Again, I'm talking about the screen. You are primed, as the Yale psychologist John Barg would say. I quote him in The Hallelujah Effect. But you can also check out Adam Curtis's 2005 Century of the Self for its discussions of the original term coined for this effect, crystallization of public opinion. The crystal referred to the crystal radio by Edward Bernays or Jacques Ellul on propaganda as this works with or without your leave. But this priming is only one part of a multi-stage process. It works better if you are in lockdown, forbidden by decree to leave your home except for essential things. Certainly, lockdown, ah yes, there we are, pictures, I forgot about that, sorry, aren't they cute? Lockdown, as I began by noting, follows the model of solitary confinement, self-imposed, with the jailed or their own jailers, and just as in the case of jail, prepare their own meals, but improving on the logistics of a jail who also obtain their own provisions, paying for their jail rent and for their own food and everything else related to their upkeep in the process. In this concentrated setting, the narrative already prepared unfolds. Enter COVID-19, an astonishingly virulent and astonishingly vague disease come from outside, a microscopic terror that is communicated first according to the WHO, not airborne, but on surfaces. Thus the image of hazmat teams spraying streets with bleach recently extended to the oddly absurd and cruel to nature that is littoral and seabird life spraying of a Spanish breach, a deliberate spill of chemicals into nature for reasons of panic fear. The properties of this disease from Wuhan, where the US government participates in the administration of several laboratories set up to bypass a number of US restrictions, some of those have recently been raised, on research binding in the US, again, they've been raised, uh, some of them, regarding bioweapons, but also GMO, experimenting with stem cells, with fetal tissue, with transhuman embryos, Experiments not a problem in Wuhan and elsewhere, including the development, as the late sociologist Paul Virilio wrote about this in Art and Fear, of those same, this is very old technology, chimeras, animal human mosaics, up to 80% human pig chimeras, 90% mouse, but that's a very small thing anyway, for the sake of DARPA funded medical research, for the sake variously of transplants, of vaccine development, where bioweapons are just the tip of the iceberg, and such things are good for all sorts of things. In his, the genesis and development of us, there they are, aren't they cute? Unfortunately, that, that wasn't an exaggeration, but anyway. It is the genesis and development of a scientific fact. Fleck reminds us of the general theory of disease permeating a certain view of disease etiology, whereby it's assumed, this is key, that a disease is caused by one disease entity. What, one asks when one hears of the death of a colleague, a friend, a neighbor, a distant family member, what did they die of? This is how statistics are made. Today, one simply writes COVID-19 on a death certificate. The narrative for that was already prepared in exceptional emergency measures already passed into law several months ago, eliminating the need for two physicians with the third physician required as a check that, at least in the UK, cut to one and eliminating any need to diagnose or even to examine the body. A perfect storm. All these deaths. And there are always all these deaths on any fine day. But now these can be ascribed to COVID-19, attesting to a pandemic and the need for health measures of whatever kind deemed necessary. 
this can be a matter of social distance according to whatever notion or mask wearing, quite ignoring the scale of a virus, which is to be sure molecule sized, molecule sized on the scale of an invasive agent. If one follows the traditional schematism of viral infection for viral access to the cell manufacturer, which is what they go in and do of DNA, RNA molecules. Once again, just to keep to scale, there's this flex lymphocytes, as you can see right there, the red blood cell, E. coli, HIV, and there, that little, little tiny dot, I don't know if you can see, is COVID-19, coronavirus. As Fleck points out, using his example of syphilis, that is, the very scientific fact invented and generated and developed as such in his case study, and typhus's parallel, the presence of the pathogen does not mean that one has the disease and may not even mean that one is a carrier of the disease, because the disease in question is a matter not of the presence of a disease entity, do you have it or do you not, but of your immune system in general. No matter how often this might be repeated, it is standard immunology and standard public health. We do not believe it. We are in search. What are you doing here? There we are. We are in search of a magic bullet because like flex little devils, we see diseases as malicious agents that can get us. Today it is COVID and we think we can shelter, be it at home, using social distancing or behind a mask or via vaccine. I already admitted, that was the wrong slide again, about, that I write about Peter Duesberg and so-called age denialists. And I argue that science faces a considerable challenge when it or government imposes the playbook of the Inquisition, decrying their work as pseudoscience. The same thing holds, just to cite Monod's recent article in Le Monde, for any scientist who fails to toe the party line, where this is the case, to be, as Duisberg is, as Montagnier is, a virologist, or to be an immunologist like those I mentioned at the start, or emergency room physician, or hospital head, or whatever you like, professor of continental philosophy of science, will not help you unless you repeat the official government sanctioned view. It is a piece of generic or casual mobbing to dismiss the science, this is my last paragraph, done by such scientists as pseudoscience, as if it were not science at all. Thus what's at stake is just what Kuhn called the received view. And what's interesting from this point of view is that there is no way to oppose the received view this is the point of Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, not that he himself was happy about this conclusion as it followed from his argument, as a received view only ceases to be received when its proponents with all their institutional power fade from power and influence. In most cases, quite as Max Planck observes, only when they die and often not even then. Thank you for your attention. I'm grateful for that. And of course, if you have questions, that would be great. Thank you very much, Dr. Babish. Um, please, uh, for our participants, uh, use the Q&A feature in Zoom if you have a question. And uh, make sure to also use the upvoting uh, to see which questions you want to really uh, hear Dr. Babish answer. So I'll start with one. Um, uh, I did see a reference to Paul Virilio there, and he actually came to my mind early on as you were talking, uh, <clears throat> particularly his notion of endocolonization, uh, which really uh, I think is captured with some of the things you talk about, like smart dust and how uh, this compulsory vaccination, um, which is just an excuse for more state control and capitalizing on a crisis, right? Um, so if you can speak to that and also how uh, COVID-19 is also affecting, at least from what we read, mostly racialized people. So here in New Mexico, the people most affected are Navajo Nation, indigenous people, and also how policing uh, affects mostly also people of color, right? So there's that. Um, we see also this intensification of police violence. Uh, if uh, And I think on social media, you see a lot of examples of that, of 
uh, police giving free masks to some people and then other people who are not wearing masks in public are arrested or you know physically abused so that's also an interesting dimension to think about thank you very 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 much for those important questions they're, they're difficult and they range over a great a great many things but it is it is also something that i'm not in new york at the moment but i'm normally in new york happens to be the case in northern manhattan where i live and in harlem my sister lives there and so she tells me and i visit her and see and see from my own eyes it makes a big difference if you travel outside of the city it's night and day and the night and day has to do with the policing but also something to be remembered is the incorporation so you're right and i think it's a brilliantly observed is that there is that huge difference in, of course, different communities and the different factors make a big difference uh, in virulence as well. Uh, but in addition to that, because of course one of the reasons for this can be many of these individuals will make up many so-called essential workers. Some people, I guess we call them conspiracy theorists, point out that it's odd that it's it's not possible for me, a professor, to go to my university to teach or my students to go, but it's perfectly fine for a bus driver to drive or for uh, grocery stock workers to stock in groceries and so on and so forth, where the wages are very often not even what Bernie Sanders was pushing for. So there's a real problem. And of course, as has been reported, I think impotently, not relief in terms of jobs uh, has been offered by those like, including Bezos who's profited unbelievably, but the stocking demands have become terribly uh, excessive. And the same thing is also true with internet providers and so on. So this is cracking. I'm not a sociological researcher, but this is cracking a unionization in a terrible way, not strengthening it. And it's very, very uh, awful. So what you point to, completely true, completely frightening, and beyond any capacity I could have to touch on even a, a bit of your question. So I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to read some of the questions uh, from our audience. Have you looked at Jordan Green Hall's medium essays on the Blue Church and how the internet and decentralized ideas threaten the broadcast? cast medium model. Also, the picture you paint is very grim. Why do you, what do you see uh, as a way out of this totalitarian dystopian present? First of all, thank you for that reference. That's always very, very useful. And, and I'm, I'm keen on learning uh, new things, but I've taken a note of that. But I would like uh, to, 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 to clarify the, the dismal, I apologized when I started by saying that it would be a somber uh, approach. At the same and by the same token, look what we're doing. So to the extent that we are able, to the extent that this conference is able to take place, this is an extraordinary thing. By pointing to the focus on the canalization, however, the just one medium, I do I cannot but think that there's a little bit, these little micro things where resistances can take place, maybe overstated, maybe because while I was teaching this recent semester, uh, 19th century philosophy, I think we were talking about Marx as accident would have it, the provider Virgin Media decided to send a message in England, Southwest England, where I am, to all of its workers who were striking by simply pulling the plug on all internet service for exactly 10 minutes at a series of intervals and everything stopped. The idea that when you're riding this wonderful surfing, this available connection, which allows us to be locked in our own homes voluntarily without going out. People, a friend of mine told me that she has family in Ireland, uh, five miles from each other and in Ireland, they will walk that distance, they do not care. Um, in New York, no, but in Ireland, yes, but they don't, or, or being Irish, perhaps they do. It's another, I didn't quite press her on that, I don't know. Uh, it's very hard to tell when I, the Irish are joking. But one, one point, though, is that you can't necessarily, despite the fact that I would like to say you've got this subversive possibility, I think we're subverting in open, 
which I think is the only real way that you can subvert. When you secretly subvert, you know, you paint great art in your basement in, in Hicksville, Long Island, it doesn't necessarily get discovered. It may be thrown out in a lot of black plastic bags that when you die, it may not be found. So it's, it's hard to do so in secret. It's also hard to do so when you've got this narrow connection. When the internet was one thing, and there were other things besides that one thing. When there were online versions of, uh, say, Dungeons and Dragons, where people could get together and really do these things for a weekend, their parents never had any idea what they were doing. Uh, that was pretty much something very different from simply what I, as someone who I have written on, uh, 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 you, you know, Chinese gold, gold farmers and so on, but I have no idea because I don't play those games. But I read about them. So these things which are more than you imagine, that's where your subversive possibility comes in. When you go to a rave, when you go to drone or any kind of, 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 of day long conference in the Netherlands that never cons concert, right? I call it a conference because that's what I know. But these things are things which can explode your possibilities and your imagination. We no longer have that. Now I can Google it on YouTube, and I don't believe it's the same thing. I also think that you hit the nail on the head with uh, your notion of screen beings. Uh, us, I think uh, uh, the one thing that really um, I took uh, from your uh, keynote is how we actually don't even notice the smudges on our screens. We're, we're so out of touch with our perception and our bodies uh right so uh i think uh, uh this is really uh, fascinating so uh, let me get another question here uh from the audience on the public consensus for vaccination what role for alternative medical practices that present alternatives to vaccines and challenge assumptions that disease is caused by one thing and a magic bullet will attack the disease oh that's that's a very compact and very 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 difficult question uh one one of the one of the problems uh, of course is that alternative medicine which is complementary medicine after all no one just does alternative medicine you always do everything uh has been systematically bad-mouthed by traditional medicine to the extent that doctors will become very, very anxious if you are taking alternative medicines because they simply don't research the effects. So it's very hard to have a complement if you don't know what it is that you're doing. And that that can be slightly problematic. I'm I'm drinking something. It's, it's, not, it's unfortunately non-alcoholic. It's grapefruit juice. Well, grapefruit juice is sufficiently alternative that it can cause all kinds of counterindications and interactions with prescription medicine. And not all of these are fully known. So there are huge problems. Grape juice is pretty innocuous, but those other things can be problematic. One of the reason one tries to eliminate these other sources is that doctors will take experimental protocol, I started in biology, where you control everything in your experiment and you don't have other factors. So it's really a wild card if you throw in other things. On the other hand, and I really wanna emphasize this, people know that they should be taking more vitamin C. People know that there are things that are extremely powerful against viral infections. I'm talking golden seal. And uh, Robert, that's in, in, in New Mexico and also going all the way up through up to the west and to the northwest because it's the American Indians that discovered golden seal. It is the most expensive drug pound for pound of any herb and it doesn't get you high. But what it does do, combined with echinacea, is it will provide a one-two for almost anything that hits you. It's extremely effective. Um, do we want to research that? Well, I don't know, it seems to make herbal gatherers a certain amount of money, but nowhere near the kind of money that a controlled drug can make, especially if that drug is packaged and repackaged and repackaged, because of course it's copyright. And that's why David Berry's worth reading and others who look on the software questions are well worth reading because they keep your stuff. And uh, that means the resale is where the money comes in. The, repackaging of a cancer drug to treat AIDS, which was the great crisis and the real problem because that was deadly for cancer patients, 
it was also deadly if you had AIDS, but in both cases, people were saying, well, how long are you gonna be living? It's not really a problem. You can take this drug, we need to sell it, and you've got insurance. Those things are problems. Those are social elements that are also part of marketing. And that's why a great deal of money is given to physicians still to have them prescribe what they should prescribe and why we read our advertisements ourselves, telling us, encouraging us to ask our physicians as if we knew what we were talking about to prescribe this or that. You can know something about Golden Seal. It's gonna cost you a few bucks at Whole Foods. It works or it doesn't. You put it in the back of the drugs, the drug cabinet in your bathroom and forget it. If it if it doesn't, take it out when you get sick again. That's how those things work. They're harmless. And that's of course the policy I would follow. Do no harm. Something that can't hurt you. And golden seal, not only won't it get you high, but it won't hurt you either. I'm a big fan of spirulina too. Um, <laughs> so here's another one from uh, the audience. Um, I noticed you spoke of chemtrails, but you didn't mention 5G effects on the body and mind. Do you have thoughts on this contiguous phenomenon? I did, and they are contiguous. They're extremely important to connect, but they're very hard to connect. It's very, very hard to connect the threats. I've written on this, uh, drawing on the work of Peter Sloterdijk uh, on manipulating the weather. But we academics, and I am an academic, so we tend to be cautious in the things that we say until we can really make a case or really set up a case in such a way to be able to talk about it. The problem is we're handicapped by those around us who do not also take up that case. So yes, there's weather control. And yes, there's a 5G problem. I teach this in my technology and ethics courses. I have for a long time. There are physicians and there are scientists who oppose this because pretty much if you turn on 5G, you can see birds fall out of the sky, just like that. Uh, they're working on that, but you know, you can modulate it. But the problems, really, really have to do with who's making these decisions. And one can say, is one really clamoring for faster and faster internet download speed so that we really want to have another 5G phone? We just upgraded our phones recently. Are we really itching to pay another grand and a half to do it again so that we can have 5G? I'm not sure this is consumer demand, but I do think it's something that is being rolled out. So that in Winchester, which is a very tiny town, I was walking with Renault people and they were busy excavating in front of a Vodafone store to install more copper wire than I had ever seen in my life. And I used to make jewelry out of copper. So I've seen copper wire uh, made it out of wire. They were installing and Vodafone has it on their webpage, underground transmitters for 5G because people don't wanna look at it. The stuff you see is two years old. The new transmitters are very, very different and will work in very, very different ways because one of the advantages or disadvantages of 5G is that you must have 5G transmitters at very, very, very frequent intervals. But that means they can be correspondingly small and you can bury them. And that's not conspiracy. That's on the Vodafone website. And they were on my Twitter page. You can go find photograph of Vodafone and the guys with their stuff happily installing it underground. It's since been covered over. You'd never know. And I'm reminded of Virilio and how he shows that uh, the speeding up of technology and basically how things keep getting smaller is also correlated with violence, more violence in modernity. Um, so here's another question. Is there a way that few people who are aware can combat state control when everyone else supports it and accepts it? Or is, or is it just a dream? That's a very hard question. And the reason that it's very, very hard is probably the reason that despite much of Marx's own analyses of why it might be really good for workers of the world to rise up, that you can find yourself on the front line of a resistance and be yourself affected dangerously by that. I mentioned 
because we are all academics, so we're really not watching this. And many of us are on various lines of tenure track or uh, in research programs or graduate students or like myself, uh, a long time invested in certain research protocols. You can do all of that. It will prevent your success in academia. And that's one of the real problems because we do, as, 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 as really should be a, a lesson to all of us, if you can win the Nobel Prize and then make a comment that you identify and are able to recognize because this is your work, that you have markers in this new virus and then have people mark that and mark your authority on an area of which you are expert and know so much that the entire scientific community has given you a particular award, I don't know what the hope for the rest of us would be. There's a reason I talked about scientific mobbing. We line up against these alternate views. Can we do it? Yes. We can read Fleck. We can read Feyerabend, that's why I put him there. We can read Latour. Latour has been mobbed and he, Latour is brilliant because he comes back and is more successful, you know, after he's done it. I don't know, he just changes his theme and he's more, he just subtly doesn't talk about that anymore. So we can do that. We can be so subtle, however, that we can forget what we were talking about in the very beginning. And I'm a Nietzsche scholar and I, I, I have lots of students who want to study Nietzsche and they say, well, I can't write about that because I never get a job, but I'll come back. They never do. So there, there are huge, huge problems with how do you privately do it? How do you otherwise do it? These are such good and difficult questions. I'm only grateful for them. So this one is a question that uh, has been upvoted by four people and it's a little bit long, so bear with me. Uh, thanks for the amazing talk. It is however quite complicated for the everyday person to follow and to trust what you're saying. You will probably be attacked on many of your statements. Conspiracy these theories have been good in framing such concerns as they make it easier for everyday people to understand. Conspiracy theories have also been weaponized by the same mainstream powers to sow confusion and stigmatize alternative visions. How do we translate these complex understandings of knowledge, contestations, and of villainizing alternative visions without the tropes of conspiracy theory? Wow. That's a very good question. Those are, that's, that's a fantastic question. The difficulty with that question, however, is that one would like to be able to point to a place where you have your certified truth. And that's, I think, where it's difficult. That's why it helps me to not have started in philosophy, where I might have thought the truth followed logical and lo you know, truth table rules, but in science. And in science, there is the real object or world or organism that may not cooperate. And scientists are very brutal about this and they will get their answers. But in the end of the day, those there is that resistance of the tissue. There is that resistance of the animal. There is that resistance of getting the answer, quite the answer that you would like. What, what Kant says in the beginning of, of preparatory words to the, to the first critique, you've really got to compel or force nature. That's what Anders is quoting. He doesn't give his footnotes, but that's what he means, torturing things until they confess. It's a complete rip off of Immanuel Kant. But it's easier maybe to read to read Anders, not really, because we still don't read him, uh, than it is to read Kant. And we don't read Ludwig Fleck. And one person who did, Thomas Kuhn, was so successful because he made what he said so very clear and Fleck not so much, so that he had to be, that's why I said it's, in this, it's, it's sort of like fascinating. He was forced, forced to write an introduction to Fleck because it was exposed, he denied it until then, that he had taken Fleck's book home with him on a daily basis from the library without signing it out. Those days they wrote it down, Kuhn took Fleck, Kuhn took Fleck and presented with this evidence and said, yeah, I took Fleck. Now that's scuttlebutt, it's also a fact. It's a fact because Robert K. Merton was able to get a man who denied that Fleck had had any influence on his work to write a forward to the English translation of Fleck. And he was able to do that because of that scuttlebutt. So there are things that are complicated. Can we get rid of complexity? 
No, because it's the real world. Real things are really complicated. That's what Nietzsche says. This is unsagbar kompliziert. It is unspeakably complicated. Uh, we deal with this in our lives. Now, you're right. Conspiracy theories are used. They are contaminated by being sort of soaked in Trump, you know, blood as it were, or muck as it were, or whatever you like. And then you think, oh, it's got to be a right perspective, you know, that, for example, do you mean we should go storm the, the, the you know, the, the, the government's uh, uh, mansion in Wisconsin? But of course, that is not the point. That's a political point. I'm suggesting one read a book. And that's a very, very different thing. And can we do that? Yes. And books, I also want to say, no matter what we like, at the end of the day, when Virgin Media pulls the plug again, those of us, not all of us, but those of us who still have books are going to have a certain advantage if we write and if we multiply. You can store your stuff on the cloud, you can store your stuff on a backup drive, and you can print things out. Yeah, I think the key difference between uh, conspiracy theorists, if we can call them that, and ourselves, people who are, let's say, big critical theorists or critical thinkers, uh, is what kind of being are we? Are we screen beings or are we different kinds of beings, right? Uh, and I think that's this is the key thing. It's let us not just get our knowledge through the screen. Go outside, listen to music, read books, right? I think this is the message here. Um, so also I'm gonna, we have five minutes, so I'm gonna take a few more questions, but then the ones I, um, we didn't take, I'm gonna post them on Slack. So you can also uh, engage there with the audience. Um, here's a question, is science or pseudoscience gaining more followers as a result of this COVID-19 experience? So we'll, that will be the last question and then I'll post the ones that you haven't answered on Slack, thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Once again, a hard thing would be to decide what would count as science and what would be pseudoscience. I think that the scientists themselves, the virologists and the immunologists, are certainly getting a wake-up call. Many of these professors have not ever experienced not being taken seriously when they say something. They're used to their authority, and now their authority seems to run counter to and have received view they've never heard of before. This isn't a funding agency. This isn't, this isn't uh, you know, an ethics board at a university. This is the government. So that can be a very, very surprising thing. So you can find yourself saying, this doesn't mesh up with how epidemiology works, or this doesn't mesh with how viruses work. That's why I showed you the scale of a virus. I showed you that so that you can stop thinking that a mask could possibly block that. It just can't possibly, it just can't. So, I mean, it's a virus. It's like blocking a super molecule. You can't block molecules. They sail right through. There is nothing there for them. So it's the empty space that your physics teacher used to tell you about. It was making up most of your table when he would knock on wood. That's, that's the level we're dealing with when we deal with a virus. It's a very, very, very complicated question. And so when, vi when immunologists say, this is not, or virologists say, this is not, they're challenged. And we demote it to pseudoscience by running a, a foul of something that serves a political agenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Babish. We'll end here. I posted the other questions on Slack, so um, if you would want to engage with them, you can do that there. Thank you so much, and thank you for your background. Your background is fantastic. Thank you for <laughs> more than more than screen being. Thank you. Yes, a lot of hats. <laughs> I have a hat. Okay. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> all right. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you very and much, thanks Anita. to uh, all the participants. <laughs>